this is basically a survey of module systems in various programming languages and some of the things that I've noticed about them being kind of a, um, a language guru, if I dare say, or a, at least a polyglot. Um, <clears throat> and what I want to start with is basically what is a module all about? What does that mean? Um, not every language has a syntax which says module, and so what are we talking about if we say module? And there's kind of a, a sapir whorf kind of effect here, linguistic relativity, because what you think a module is is certainly influenced by the languages that you know. Um, just like what types, what you think about types is influenced by the languages that you've had experience with. Um, and so if you tell a C programmer that you're doing these fancy things with types, they'll think you're kind of crazy. Um, but uh, so what is a module? I think there are three things to look at. Maybe the simplest is that it's just about separate compilation, right? I want to have my program broken into units that can be compiled separately or in a dynamic language, maybe even loaded separately um, when, you, when you import them. Second, it's about namespace management, which is a pretty simple idea, but it's extremely important. And third, maybe the, the richest area, is that it's about abstraction. And one element of abstraction is just hiding, right? Just concealing things. But also abstraction means parameterization. And so we'll look at both kinds of um, abstraction. So I'm going to start out with that um, programming language that's kind of the lingua franca and um, known as a bastion of modularity, C. Um, <coughs> So in C, a module, if you want to call it that, and maybe you can use scare quotes, a module is basically just a file. And several languages have this approach that a file is a module. Um, in some languages, you can have files, you can have modules which are not files, but all files, are, you know, it, it goes both ways. Um, and the other th interesting thing that C does that we don't always see in languages is this idea of separating declarations from definitions so that you can have an interface, um, a .h file, and then have um, an implementation in a .c file. And that's something that Java more or less abandoned, but some other languages try to keep some distinction there too. So that's the separate compilation component. What about namespace management in C? Do we have anything? Well, basically all that you can do for namespace management is don't export stuff by making it static within whatever module or file that, it, that it's in. And that's, that's what you get. Um, when we move to C++, of course, namespaces are something that got a lot richer with C++. And so we have, indeed, syntax for namespaces that can enclose things. We can import them. We can import just particular members. We can rename them, which I actually didn't know, but I found that. Um, and then we've got this scope operator that can reach in, just like a dot operator in more modern languages. Um, so namespace management in C++ is fairly rich. Um, what about abstraction and hiding? So just in pure C, there's this pattern, this technique for doing abstract data types, where you can declare um, an opaque type declaration, you just say struct stack, and you don't know, you don't say what it is, but that's okay, as long as you only refer to pointers to it, then we don't have to know what its members are, what size or shape it is. Um, so that's a kind of opaque type declaration. You could even say it's a fancy existential type. Um, you can make an analogy, except it breaks down pretty fast, but, but there's also this trick of using void star to say that this is just some pointer, and we don't care what it is, and so generics work that way in, in C. In C++, we, of course, have templates, um, as much as I've tried to forget about them. Um, <laughs> and that is more like a real uh, universal quantifier, a real um, abstraction of a type, um, except that it's not really type checked in advance. It's type checked once you instantiate it. And so that makes templates a lot more fussy, I would say. Um, and the error messages are horrible. Um, they, they certainly make Scala's type errors look, look concise and understandable. Um, 
so, so that's type abstraction in C++. There's other kinds of hiding besides type abstraction. And of course, in most object-oriented languages, we have classes which have private members. So private is a form of access control. That's a kind of hiding. Um, so that's, that's useful. And then there's another common technique which we can call privacy via subsumption, which is a fancy name. But it just means that your private stuff doesn't really have to be marked private if your interface is such that it doesn't have any private stuff, but all the real work happens in some implementation class, which is derived from that, or implements that, or, or whatever your terminology is. So although these things are not marked private, I'm not going to get access to them as long as I'm only seeing them at the superclass level. Um, struct and class are interchangeable in C++, it turns out. You know, the only difference between class and struct is that a struct is by default public, and a class is by default private. But other than that, you can, you can do this. But this is a common technique in object-oriented languages anyway, to, to have uh, an interface class and an implementation class. Um, so that's um, C++. Now we're going to move into um, Haskell and look at some of the same ideas. But what's interesting about Haskell is that as far as modules go, it's not very sophisticated. Uh, the Haskell module system is mainly about namespace management. Um, so you can do things like, up here I say I've got a module, and they can be nested, which, which is useful. Um, this is the set of definitions that I'm exporting, so I can limit what I export. Um, and then I can import things. I can do imports where I only import certain elements from there. I can do some renames or qualified imports like that. Um, so you can do um, namespace management with these, but they don't get you a whole lot else. Um, and then the other major thing in, in Haskell is type classes, right? And so our type classes modules, well, um, I went too fast. Uh, type classes are very interesting. They can do lots of great things. Um, they do a, a kind of namespace management in the sense that they do overloading, right? It's like a principled overloading mechanism. This is an example from um, QuickCheck, which is the randomized testing library for Haskell. Um, and this was pretty neat the first time I saw it, definitely, that you can define a, a class arbitrary that allows you to generate values of arbitrary types. Um, and I haven't said what gen is, but you just it's something where you can pull values out of it. Um, so you can define that for all the base types, like Boolean and integers and so forth, and you have, you have random uh, values of those types. And then you define these derived type classes so that if I have um, an instance of arbitrary for A and B, which are type parameters, then I can generate pairs of A and B, of course, just by pairing them together. Um, and there are all kinds of definitions of that in, in quick check. So that's a kind of overloading. And then I can do a kind of abstraction based on these type classes. So any function could have basically for all alpha, for all types, so that they implement these two type classes, then I can implement this function. Um, so that's, um, are they modules? I'm, I'm a little hesitant to, to call that a module, but, but it has some of those, uh, some of those features. The next language I want to look at is the one I've spent the most time in, and that's ML, especially standard ML. This is quite an old book now. But I still think there are some ideas in ML uh, module system that are pretty interesting. And in case they're not widely known, I'll, I'll show you some, some examples of that. Uh, so the first thing that we do, this kind of gets back to what I said about C, where you've got a distinction between declarations and definitions, right? And so signatures are a way to just have declarations of types and values um, so that, like for example, here's a collection signature where I define a type T, which is parameterized by A. In ML, the um, type parameters are, type operators are postfix. So in Scala, this would be T brackets A, and here it's A T. Um, so this collection has a value empty, and a function is empty that returns a Boolean. 
and we can define all kinds of signatures like that. You can mix and include signatures in other signatures like this. Okay, so I define a queue, and then a deck, which is a double-ended queue, um, includes collection, and then it can have structures, nested um, structures within it that match certain signatures. So the double-ended queue has you know, a front side where you can enqueue and dequeue and a rear side where you can do the same. Um, so those are some examples of just specifying uh, the values or the functions that, that are available or should be available. So next what I do is go to the definition side, and that's called a structure. So structures are just nested collections of definitions, and they can be constrained by signatures. So up here I define a structured deck, which is constrained by the signature deck on the previous slide. And this actually is an opaque signature match, which basically provides a form of abstraction. It means that this definition of T as a pair of lists won't leak out of this structure. It's constrained uh, to, to stay private inside there. And you can't rely on it being a pair of lists from outside. So that's a very important form of hiding. And then we can define some of the functions. We can define substructures and, and so on. OK, so if the ML module system was just about signatures and structures, it wouldn't look all that different from what I showed you in C. Um, where you have declarations and definitions, and you can have abstract types in C. But what makes it a little fancier is the next thing, which is called functors. And functors are basically structures that are parameterized by other structures. Um, so in this example, uh, just in case you're familiar with the name functor from category theory or from Haskell or Scala Z or something, the name kind of comes from the same place, but it doesn't really mean the same thing. This doesn't refer to um, the applicative functor kind of thing with the certain operations. It's just, it's just a name for functions of structures. Um, so what we do here is define a functor with the name test deck, and it can take any structure, any module D, which satisfies the deck interface, and then we can define whatever we want based on that. Right? So in this case, I might define a particular queue and then go through and run some tests on it and make sure that it works the way I expect or whatever. Um, and then to actually instantiate that functor, a little bit like instantiating templates in C++, but it works better, is to, what I will do is take the functor test deck and then pass in whatever implementation of decks that I want. And so if I've got three different implementations that match this same signature, I can just generate three different um, output structures based on that, and all of them will be capable of testing the different implementations of the deck generically, right? So that's kind of a, a valuable idea to, to be able to program at the level of structures where we have um, essentially functions that can take in all these definitions and create new definitions based on those. Um, this leads to a style that a lot of ML programmers adopt, um, which we call functorized style, or heavily functored style, or something like that. And what we're doing there is that for most dependencies between structures, so it's very common to have a, a module need to refer to another module, and maybe those both refer to other modules, and so on. In most cases, what you could do is lift those dependencies up and make them functor parameters. Okay, and now your module is basically closed with respect to any other structures that it would depend on. It only depends on signatures, for example. And you don't have to do this. It's just a, a style that, that some people adopt. So this is some code, approximately, from, uh, from the SML compiler itself. And what it does is um, these are, of course, the body of the functor is missing because it would take up much more than a slide. Um, but this compile functor takes a code generator module, which is machine specific, and generates some kind of other compiler interface. And then what we're doing here is basically putting together the REPL for SML, a read eval print loop that we can interact with. And so we sort of stack these abstractions together such that um, 
well, you, you can kind of match up the signatures here, except that compile zero and top compile are not exactly the same, but one subsumes the other, so it still matches. Um, so to look at the instantiation of it, basically, we take some code generator that's machine specific for whatever architecture and wrap that to create the full compiler and then create the read eval print loop from it and an interactive top level that we get out of that. And um, you can reinstantiate these things lots of ways. Of course, if you want to do cross compiles, then you can substitute in different, um, different machine specifications there, different code generators. Um, of course, cross compiling is something that the ML compiler is good at, but it's not something you want to do at the read eval print level um, because you couldn't actually eval. Um, <coughs> Maybe you can you can read and ship it to some other computer and ev eval it. Um, so this is the functorized style in in ML, and it's something that I think is worth looking at and and doing, perhaps in Scala. Um, yeah, it's it's very similar. And I'm going to show um, I'm going to show just some examples of ways to think of parameterizing. Um, different sorts of algorithms and, and such to get modularity. Um, and yeah, that's, so Scala, I think you can do much, much more with, with traits than, than you can do with functors, although there are some interesting differences. One difference is um, in ML, there's a notion of, of link time. And basically, these, um, these functor applications um, happen before runtime. So, um, your compiler goes along and it's going to actually execute all of the functor applications. If there's code that gets run, it gets run before the normal runtime. And so this gives you a kind of rudimentary staging that you can do. Um, and in, in Scala, we won't have that. The, any uh, classes or objects you're using in this way will be evaluated when they're evaluated later on. Um, so that part of it is more dynamic. So let's just look at um, some Scala code I was playing with. I, um, I created a little data type for a directed graph. And this is kind of, I, I might call it a double-decker <laughs> trait or a double-decker interface um, because I'm, I'm used to ML. And I guess it's just a factory pattern, right? That I've got these operations on a graph, which is at the inner trait, and then I can create it as well. But that gives me more like what we have in ML for signatures because the signatures are not dependent on having a self type or something. But, but here I, you split them into those two parts. Um, so here's, here's my directed graph signature. And then this is mutable, um, for which I apologize. But I, um, I don't want to show off functional programming chops right now. So that's, that's it. Uh, but when we go to represent this and implement this, you can think of different ways to represent graphs. Um, and so the famous ones from computer science textbook might be that we can use an adjacency list or an adjacency matrix. And of course, maybe the list has better space performance for um, sparse graphs and so forth. There are different trade-offs. But in general, what we can do is look at this as just a map. Um, of vertex to, to vertex to edge, whatever the data types are for these things. Um, and so the first, the first map will take our vertices here or maybe the, the rows. And the second map is about the columns or maybe it's a list. But what we can do is be completely generic in which kinds of maps we want to use in each case. So here's an analog of a functor that we could do where um, there's kind of a lot of type code at the top. But what I'm doing is creating a directed graph implementation using the mutable map factory twice. And the first map is going to give me that, that first level, and the second map is going to give me the second level. And later on, we can decide what those should be, right? But then I can do my graph implementation based on that. And the representation will just start off with an empty map of the first kind. Um, so. We can implement graphs where essentially the entire data structure is outsourced to, to these other, um, these other uh, 
mutable map um, representations. And so we're just uh, relying on that to build our own notion of a graph. And then we can instantiate that, that functor using whatever um, types of maps that we want. And so something like an adjacency list might have a hash map for the first one and a list map for the second one. Or if you use two hash maps, then it's a little bit more like um, an adjacency matrix, I suppose, or at least that's the analogy I'm going for. But we don't have to rewrite any code, right? It's just the same uh, representation, I mean the same logic, the same implementation, but we're substituting in essential parts of that data structure to get different space-time characteristics, right? The next thing I wanted to be able to do is take some more insp inspiration from C++. And C++ programmers have this, um, maybe it's a fantasy or maybe just a desire, that, that we can have algorithms that are implemented independent of whatever representations you want to use. Um, and so algorithm is part of the standard template library. And I wanted to do something a little bit along those lines. Um, so here's an implementation of graph search as a functor, you know, using the analogy to ML, um, where I can define a search, but a lot of the way that I do the search can be outsourced to these other signatures or other modules that I will instantiate at some point, right? So to do a search, I need a work list to decide what to do next or to keep track of where I am. And that work list can be some other um, signature that I just defined somewhere else. And then I need a set to keep track of which ones I visited. And um, so I can use the mutable set factory to get, to get that. So here's, here's the trait for that work list. It, work list is just something that um, might be empty, or I can put something or take something, again, it's mutable. Um, and I can create one so it's the factory and the, the uh, ADT all together like that. So that's a work list signature. And of course, my work list could be implemented a variety of different ways. One way might just be to use a stack. So here's a simple way with traits to build a, a last in, first out object that uh, extends work list signature. And um, to put a new object you push, to take it you pop. But you can do the same thing with a FIFO, right? To put you in queue, to take you DQ. And both of these implement my work list signature. So then it becomes very flexible to have different algorithms that arise from different um, choices for these. So breadth first search is basically my graph search where I just plug in a FIFO and depth first search where I plug in uh, a stack instead. And you, um, you get a lot of flexibility out of that. So that's a very simple example, but it, it reminds me of the way that we do things in ML. So I just wanted to kind of show you what that looks like. Um, here's just an example of it running. I, I drew a little graph and I, I implemented it. Even this example is um, parameterized by the graph representation. So you can create this, whether it's the, the matrix or the set, you create the same graph. And then you can run breadth first search or depth first search either way. Um, and this, this produces the path that it took to get to in, in reverse order, but the path it took to get to the, uh, the node. Okay, so now I'd just like to step back a little bit and make a bit of a point about modularity in general. Um, it seems to me that a lot of the fancier um, ways to modularize and reuse code start out in untyped languages. Um, and then we eventually once they prove useful and we understand them, we eventually find ways to give them types. And so traits came from, um, or similar mechanisms have been proposed, but, uh, but this paper is about traits in small talk. And there are older systems. Um, flavors was a kind of mix-in that made it into a common Lisp object system. And there are lots of um, ideas here, but what they have in common is that they're not really concerned about types the way that we are in Scala. So um, there's a, a way in which we can look to, for inspiration at the um, 
less well-typed languages maybe to, to find ways to do modular developments. Um, and here is <laughs> a popular slash infamous blog post by uh, Gilad Bracha that types are anti-modular, which I don't necessarily disagree with. Um, and he's, he's a proponent of some of, some of these systems as well. So uh, basically, uh, well, you can read that later. Um, and then here from the C++ reference manual, I, there's a quote. It, it wasn't obvious how to combine the C++ strong static type, type checking with a scheme flexible enough to support mix-ins uh, used in some Lisp dialects. So what, that's basically what they're saying is that, okay, we have templates, and templates can do some fancy things, but we don't really know how to type them still. Um, and so what I think is, is valuable about Scala is that we have ways to, um, to type check this stuff. There is one thing I found just last night. I wasn't aware of this system before, um, but this is an account of traits in a specification language that goes back to, I think this is 1985 or so. Um, and although it's a specification language, not a programming language, there, there clearly are type, infor there's type information here. And I'm not sure how or how well it was type checked and that kind of thing, but um, it's something I would like to look into more because it seems to be an earlier instance of typed trait-like things that I had never known about. All right, thank you. Thank you.